To say a few words about uh, Tony um, Mara in um, introduction. Um, in the book world, you often hear young writers described as the most promising of their generation. In fact, you hear it so often that it starts to lose meaning. Well, Anthony Mara truly deserves that kind of praise. And more than that, the promise in his work has already been fulfilled. His fiction is as riveting, harrowing, bleakly funny, and finely wrought as anything going right now. And I say that as a member, roughly speaking, of the same generation. Um, <laughs> Tony's debut novel, A Constellation of Vital Phenomena, was one of the most lauded books of the last several years. And here's where I have to pause to get into the CV thickets a little bit because they are dense here. Um, Constellation of Vital Phenomena won numerous awards, including uh, the National Book Critics Circle, inaugural John Leonard Prize, the Ansfield Wolf Book Award in Fiction, Barnes & Noble Discover Award, and appeared on over 20 year-end lists, including the New York Times um, and Washington Post. Um, it also won a California Book Award and the Athens Prize for Literature. It was a finalist for the National Book Award, New York Public, Lions, New York Public Library Lions, Young Lions Award, and the Penn Robert Bingham Fellowship, among others. Uh, it was intensely well received and, and much deserved so. Um, so, Constellation of Vital Phenomena is largest set in a half destroyed hospital in Chechnya during the conflict in that region. It's a big but intimate book that follows six main characters, but also picks up what you might call the pocket histories of many others. Um, Tony does this really cool thing in that book where he'll jump into minor characters and give us almost their entire life, life story in like a paragraph or two. It's an incredibly virtuosic move and makes the book feel just huge. Um, critics said about Vital Phenomenon, Constellation of Vital Phenomenon, Ron Charles from the Washington Post, called the novel A Flash in the Heavens That make you, Makes You Look Up and Believe in Miracles. Here in fresh, graceful prose is a profound story that dares to be as tender as it is ghastly, a story about desperate lives in a remote land that will quickly seem impossibly close and important. Ron Charles said, I haven't been so overwhelmed by a novel in years. I have to say, you simply must read this book. And Madison Smart Bell said in the New York Times book review, Extraordinary, A 21st Century War and Peace. Mara seems to drive his astral column in the face of catastrophe directly from Tolstoy. So that was Tony's first book. His second book, um, a book of linked stories called The Czar of Love and Techno, what a great title, is largely set in Russia but also ranges far and wide, both in geography from the Caucasus to the Arctic Circle and even out into space. And over time, it goes from the Stalin era to the distant future. To call it a linked collection is not entirely accurate. It's, it's one of the more novelistic story collections I think I've encountered. And one of the really excellent, amazing things it does is that it interconnects the characters in so many fascinating ways. Um, and those linkages are as lucid as they are intricate and mysterious. Tony, I think, is telling us that the violence and oppression um, that comes out of war um, uh, warps not just the lives of individuals, individuals, but the very fabric of history and existence as well. And to see him stitch back those ruptures through the interconnections between those characters is incredibly moving. Even though these characters exist in a very degraded world of violence, almost a surreal world of destruction. Neither of these books is bludgeoning. Nara remembers that people, no matter how degraded their circumstances might be, are resilient, and that they cope as we all do through humor. His characters are charming, sardonic, and vulgar, but somehow they're also tender towards one another, which is to say that Mara is tender towards them, and then these hugely ambitious, hugely assured books about the bleakest of situations, warmth and life, still manage to shine through. Okay. I would also say that in some ways Tony approaches these books in an unusual way, and I think we'll talk about this more tomorrow, um, in that uh, research is extremely important for Tony, and also I think um, the work of other writers um, uh, is extremely important as well. Um, but that's not to say that Tony uh, is not evident in his fiction. I see the same wicked humor and intelligence and care for others in his personality, and so for these reasons and more, I think we're thrilled to have him here at Chicago. So please watch him. Thank you, Will, for that, that incredibly kind introduction. I've got my little time. All right. Uh, for that in incredibly kind in in introduction, and thank you all for, um, for inviting me here and, and for coming out this evening. Um, 
I'm going to read a, a couple of different sections from, from my new book, uh, uh, The Czar of Love and Techno. As, as Will mentioned, it's kind of this, um, this interlocking series of short stories. And it started out as a short story collection of, of completely independent uh, uh, stories. And after I published my, my first novel, um, I, would, I would do readings and people would ask, what are you working on next? And I'd say, a short story collection. And you could just see the disappointment um, uh, coming off of, of their faces. And I began to think of how the short story collection as a form is, is uh, marginalized in many ways. We, we tend to sort of see it as something that writers do either on their way to writing uh, a big novel or something they do maybe if they're feeling a bit lazy. Um, or it's, you know, it's the, 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 the scraps from the back of the drawer that you cobble together in a book. And it, it always struck me that that was, um, that that seemed like a, a rather um, misguided way of, of looking at it, since um, the short story collection as a form has the potential to tell a story that is, or tell a narrative that's much bigger and, and broader than anything you could really fit into, uh, fit into a novel. And so that was sort of uh, became the impetus for, um, for trying to, to create this single narrative out of these various short stories. So I'm going to read a, a, a couple of different ones, uh, sections from a couple of different ones. Um, this first one sort of all, uh, this first one actually, the original idea, this was a couple of years ago, was uh, for this uh, young man um, to become a con artist um, after reading The Art of the Deal. Um, it seemed kind of far-fetched at the time, um, but, uh, but there we have it. So the only thing really to, to know about this is, um, is there's a father named Vladimir and, and a son named Sergei. And Vladimir was um, absent for much of his son's childhood. Um, Sergei is... Uh, um, is, is a young man, and, and he intentionally um, injured himself, injured his knee in order, to, uh, in order to get out of military service. Hello. Is this Mrs. Joanne McGlinchey of 1898 Calvert Road, Ohio? Yes, and your birthday is October 12th, 1942. My name is John Smith from IRS. Yes, madam, to my displeasure, your taxes will be audited unless you provide certain information. First, you must tell me your social security and bank account numbers. Also, your mother's maiden name. To verify your identity, yes. At the IRS, we take identity theft most seriously. <laughs> Look at him go. An incredible thing, really to sit in the gloom of a Chernyshevskaya cyber cafe and watch his boy work. Some kind of prodigy, Vladimir's boy. In the case of nature versus nurture, Vladimir threw his support firmly behind the plaintiff. The stuff of eugenicists' dreams runs through his child's veins. Don't get cocky now, Vladimir. Fatherhood points aren't doled out for time served. You should look up at the library, the fathers of other wunderkinds, Mozart, Pushkin, etc. Were they too absent in their child's formative years? Does the father's absence force the child to grow up sooner, to mature artistically, creatively, emotionally? Ha! Very witty, Sergei continued, two chairs down, broadcasting broken English into a wiry headset. The cafe bustle tuned out. I assure you, the KGB and IRS do not have an exchange program. Too much life in his voice to pull off convincing bureaucraties. Too much love in his labor. Only trust a government worker whose personality is as thin and stamped upon as a time card. But who is Vladimir to question the maestro? Take your time, Mrs. McGlinchey, Sergei said. Pocketbooks can be most difficult to find. Vladimir had missed graduation ceremonies and chess tournaments on account of his incarceration. He had never seen his son perform for him. Had this beaming pride been building all along, concentrating in his system like a magnificent mercury poisoning? Mustn't let Sergei forget these last few years when he's fabulously wealthy. Mustn't let him forget that first day home from the hospital. White plaster and bandages had braced Sergei's leg. The poor kid had looked at the knee-high bathtub lip as if it were Everest. I don't want to take a shower. I'm not dirty, he had said. It's okay. It's okay, Vladimir had said. But it wasn't okay. Not at all. 
He had never given his son a bath before. Where to begin? Take off Sergei's socks, his shoes, run the water first. Does he get in with Sergei? Does he look away? I don't want to, I'm not dirty, his son had said, but one whiff would have woken a coma patient. Vladimir had swaddled the bandaged legs in plastic bags and rubber bands, set a stool in the tub, had changed into his bathing suit. He had lifted his son into the tub and set him on the stool, had spat out the rusty aftertaste of shower hose water. It was too hot. He lathered his son's hair and shoulders. It was too cold. The armpit, the hip bone, the belly button. These strange parts he'd last seen unclothed when his son was too young to spell his own name. This grown man still fit inside his father's arms just right. Are you okay? Vladimir had asked. Sergei had replied in a garbled sob, the compact heat of, of his breath like a hand dryer on Vladimir's skin. If you could trade, Vladimir, but you couldn't. If there was a way to make it okay, but there wasn't. If you can, but you can't. Why are children doomed to remain beautiful to their parents, even when they become so ugly to themselves? It's not fair, his son had said. It isn't, Vladimir had agreed. He had gone on soaping Sergei's fingers and underarms. Who can you be but the chest your child shouts into? the shoulder he balances upon, the hands washing him clean. The shower drizzled steamy gray stripes, a towel lolled on the closed bathroom door. There was so much he wanted to make right. Six months later, he had signed Sergei up for, English, for, for, for language classes taught by an Australian man with English teeth. Al Pacino quotes, qualified for rudimentary English, and Sergei placed out of the intro course. Within two years, he spoke well enough to take Business English 1 and 2, which used Donald Trump's autobiography for a textbook. In such richly manured soil, a seed hardly needs sunlight to grow. Very good, Mrs. McClinchy. The last four digits are 2921. I will correct the error into the system and we will avert the audit. The world's greatest bullshit harvester ties himself to the crop's most insatiable market with no more than a phone line. If this is capitalism, no wonder communism failed. Sergei wished Mrs. McGlinchey a fine day and rang off. Well, what did you think? What did Vladimir think? His son was slaying giants, that's what he thought. I don't know what you said, my boy, but you said it beautifully. Sergei gave a bashful smile. Vladimir wanted to pull his boy into his arms and say, do you see? I told you you'd be happy. Now, do you see? Instead, he asked, why do these foolish Americans believe you? When I first started, they didn't, he said. I was calling numbers at random from an online telephone directory, saying to them, hello, you have run, won the sweepstakes. Please give me your bank account numbers. And no one believed you. Sergei shook his head. It took me a long time to understand the American mindset. Fear of their cruel and capricious government weighs heavily on their psyche. They're more inclined to believe that they'll lose what they have than receive what they want. Better, I decided, to be the tax man than the, than the sweepstakes. But that wasn't good enough. There were still too many skeptics. Then I remembered something you told me, Papa. Vladimir leaned in. About that list you and your mother were on because your dad was an enemy of the people. I figured that somewhere online, there must be a list of Americans who will believe anything, no matter how implausible or insulting to their intelligence. Is there such a list? Vladimir asked. There is, his son said. Tom Hanks's Facebook fan page. <laughs> Vladimir had no idea what his son was talking about. You remember how mom had that embroidered pillow, he said? When she got upset, she'd shout into it and no one would hear her. That's Facebook. And Forrest Gump, you must have seen Forrest Gump. Is it a nature film? Vladimir asked. No, no, it's classic cinema, Sergei said, about how every achievement in American society over the last 50 years was really just the dumb luck of a mentally challenged man. This was a Soviet propaganda film, Vladimir said. No, it's a big Hollywood movie, Sergei insisted. They play it for children in history class over there. 
I cross-referenced the names and birthdays pulled from Tom Hanks' Facebook fan page with white pages. Why, might you ask, would they put their birthdays right there on the internet when it's one of the three pieces of information necessary to steal their identity so that strangers will wish them a happy birthday? It's incredible. <laughs> I don't believe it either. When I called up Mrs. McGlinchey, I had her name, address, and birthday, told her I was from the IRS, and asked that she provided the necessary information to prove her identity. The trick is to make the American feel that, <clears throat> that he must convince you of his identity rather than the other way around. Tom Hanks' fans are maybe 10 times more likely to fall for this than the average American because there's something wrong with them, Vladimir asked. I wouldn't go that far, Sergei cautioned. I would just say that those who enjoy Tom Hanks' acting are unfamiliar with human nature. <laughs> Wasn't this what every parent hopes for? To equip your child with the confidence and support to seize opportunity, to succeed where you had failed. His boy, an entrepreneur, he felt a strange surge of gratitude for the vision of his leaders. Here in the new Russia, you weren't bound by the past, the grandson of an enemy of the people, the son of a convict, his boy, Sergei, a successful businessman. Sergei explained that even though he had Mrs. McGlinchey's bank numbers, he wouldn't touch a penny. Of course he wouldn't. His boy was honest and sensitive to the feelings of others. His primary school teachers always said so. Instead, Sergei would sign her up for a few dozen credit cards, link them to phony PayPal accounts, and transfer thousands into his own personal account. Even if she's got bad credit, Sergei said, we should still be able to get a couple thousand dollars. And it's not like we're taking anything from Mrs. McGlinchey per personally, just the credit card companies. A beautiful word, Vladimir thought, we, to be taken into the intimacy of a personal pronoun. Go forth, my child, but take me with you. I don't even think that what I'm doing is illegal, he went on. MMM and those other pyramid schemes, they didn't go to jail. The bankers in the West who created the world economy, they didn't go to jail. It's just the free market at work. Only terrorists go to jail for what they say on the telephone, Vladimir said. Water this seed with much ambition and love and encouragement. Don't apologize for your success, my boy. The lay person cannot possibly understand the complexities of high finance. I am trying to do good, Sergei said. My boy, my little oligarch, you're doing so well. Sergei limped toward the WC with enough cheer in his gait that he nearly walked right. Vladimir wa moved to Sergei's seat. The computer stared him down, no more than a television lashed to a typewriter by, by wiggly telephone cords as far as he was concerned. He tried the he headset, nothing. A halved egg of plastic sat on a square blue foam. The receiver? He put it to his ear. Are you there, Gogol? I'm searching for someone. The monitor didn't blink. Hello, Gogol. The waitress tapped his shoulder. A long grin was pressed between her lips. It's a mouse, she said. You don't speak into it. <laughs> he assessed the plastic egg thing. I know mice, he said. This is not a mouse. <laughs> it's only called a mouse, she explained. You set it on the mouse pad and moved it, move it around. A little white arrow drifted across the screen. Do you see this, he declared, dashing his palm against the table. The machine has surrendered without a fight. It may have beaten Kasparov, but it knows better than to test me. She opened Internet Explorer for him before returning to the register. It's Google, not Gogol. You type what you're searching for and hit enter. He studied the keyboard. No sense to its arrangement. Not even the alphabet would submit to alphabetical order these days. Everyone had to be an individualist. Best to start simple. Let this Google thing warm its engines. Is the, is the earth flat, he typed. Images of globes, biographies of Columbus, circum, uh, circumferences and curvatures crowded across the, the monitor with dizzying suddenness. Vladimir had expected 
Google to come back with a simple da or nyet, but this, this was something else. He typed in Japan, chopsticks, Tokyo high rises, Wikipedia articles, travel guides, mushroom clouds. He typed knee and a thousand different knees popped up along with exhaustive accountings of every bone, muscle, and tendon, diagnoses and treatments for every injury from arthritis to gunshot wounds. How was a universe of information compressed into this little metal box? He couldn't fit a whole chicken into his toaster oven, and this, this fit the entire world. It felt tinged with sacrilege, even for him, an atheist. No one should know this much. It must be illegal. He glanced behind, certain that dark-suited security forces would soon storm in, confiscate the computer, lead him away in handcuffs. Nothing but jittery teenagers blasting each other in blood-spattered squares of light. If this machine knew everything, would it know his father? Vasily Osipovich Markin, he typed. He didn't hit the enter key. Not yet, because he'd never written his father's name before, had never even seen it written. The cursor blinked impatiently. What good could come from this? You had to keep your eyes forward. Don't turn your head. Don't mind what lies in the periphery. Behind you is only ruin. He deleted Vasily Osipovich Markin and typed instead Roman Osipovich Markin, his uncle. He wanted to hit enter, but he was already standing, already out of the chair, backing away. He was, what the devil, was he crying? You've ripened into a pungent piece of cheese, Vladimir. Yes, fine, okay, just get me out of here. What's wrong? The waitress asked when he reached the door. Tell Sergei I'm not feeling well. Tell him I've gone home. When Sergei emerged from the bathroom, his father had already left. He sat down at the computer. The cursor blipped behind Roman Osipovich Markin in the search bar. His father's uncle. Curious, Sergei hit return. Um, so this is, this is from the, the very end of, of the book. Um, and this character, Roman Markin, is, is sort of what, what ties, uh, ties the whole thing um, together. I became fascinated with this idea of, of artists uh, being employed to censor images in, in uh, the Soviet era. Um, we tend to, to think, for instance, of, uh, of the airbrush as being this contemporary tool of photographic manipulation, uh, but it sort of had its 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 first heyday in um, in the Stalinist era. To simply possess an image of a traitor was a traitorous act in and of itself. So artists were uh, were employed to um, to take out uh, uh, images of those who had fallen from uh, from from grace with the state. Um, and I became sort of fascinated with this idea of, of what it would like to be one of these artists, spe specifically a portrait artist, somebody who has been trained to imprint um, uh, the essence of a particular and individual face onto the page and who was instead tasked with, uh, with taking them out. At the time, school children would, uh, would, would censor faces in their own te textbooks with, um, with their, their jars of ink. So you had kids who were learning um, to censor with the same tools and implements at the exact same time as they were learning uh, how to write. Um, and, and this idea of, of, um, of art being a tool of, of coercion and destruction as much as, as it, it, it can be one of, of you know, reclamation um, was an idea that, uh, that sort of fascinated me. Um, so I will, uh, I'll read this, this uh, maybe one little section uh, from the perspective of this, of this uh, portrait artist who, who, who becomes a... Um, who becomes one of these uh, censors. In my generation, the, port, the position of correction artist is a consolation prize for failed painters. I attended the Imperial Academy of Arts for one year, where I made small still lives of fruit bowls and flower vases, each miniature as realistic as a photograph, before moving on to portra portraiture, my calling, the most perfect art. The portrait artist must acknowledge human complexity with each brushstroke, brush the eyes, nose, and mouth, mouth that compose a sitter's face, just like the suffering and joy that compose his soul, are similar to those of ten, 10 million others, yet singular to him. 
This acknowledgement is where art begins. It may also be where mercy begins. If criminals drew the faces of their victims before perpetrating their crimes, and judges drew the faces of the guilty before sentencing them, then there would be no faces for executioners to draw. In August 1931, agents of the OGPU told me that Vasily Markin, my brother, will be arrested within a fortnight on charges of religious radicalism. They told me my brother had married, that his wife was pregnant. They gave me his address. It was a test. It must have been. So much was lost in communication between rayons that had I warned Vaska, had he fled Leningrad, he might still be alive. Had I done that, had the agents raided his apartment in the early hours and found him missing, they would have come for me instead. I believe this, I must, because if I begin to wonder, if I begin to think that perhaps they tipped me as a professional courtesy so that I could warn my brother, if I begin to think all roads in that direction lead to darkness. That October, after the arrest, trial, and execution, the agents returned with a brown envelope. Have a seat, citizen, the senior among them said, and gestured to my divan, where I, I had just been eating dessert. I followed his extended hand, suddenly a guest in my own home. The officers sat on either side of me, making the divan feel like the back seat of a black crow police van. And the senior agent opened the envelope and slid a photograph across the heat-ringed coffee table. If I gasped, it was from shock, from terror, from some dark thing rending inside me that might have been the birth pangs of remorse. I had corrected some thousand photographs in that year alone, but not one had I recognized, not one had I been a, a part of. The portrait the agent held out had been taken in 1906 on a Wednesday. My father, a haberdasher, had closed the shop that morning. He was well regarded in haberdashery circles, having built his reputation on a pearl netting kokoshnik that had made a minor countess the talk of a winter palace ballroom. My mother did the bookkeeping, the restocking, the hiring of seamstresses, nearly everything she felt but placing the hat on the buyer's head. She had grown up on potatoes and made sure her children grew up on meat. We dressed in our finest clothes that Wednesday in 1906 and took the train from Pavlovsk to Petersburg to the photographer's studio. It had been our mother's idea, as most good ideas were. A portrait by camera instead of paintbrush would convey in a single image the forward-looking optimism she had spent her life enacting. Peacock plumage roosted on my mother's head, but in the photograph, it is dishwater gray. I stand in front of her with a faint smile. Not even the noose of my necktie could strangle the excitement of having my picture taken. And beside me, wearing a matching necktie, a matching smile, his cowlick roughly brushed, his face broad, my brother stood stiffly, gazing through the lens, through time, to meet my eyes as I sat framed between the agents who had executed him. After leaving the photographer's studio, my parents had taken us to the Petersburg Zoological Gardens. It had been a terrible decade for the zoo. The grounds had largely been abandoned, and many of the cages were empty. But I was a child and didn't understand what those empty cages meant. What still lived at the zoo was a revelation. I had never before spied an animal larger than a milk cow, more ferocious than a hungry dog. Who could have imagined a beast as strange and melancholic as a giraffe? But of every animal we saw that afternoon, I remember none more clearly than the leopard. Loose-limbed and lanky, nostrils spouting narrow triangles of steam, claws clicking coded messages across the concrete floor, eyes all pupil, each step unfurled through its spine. It was an inconceivable creature at which my brother and I first marveled and then threw breadcrumbs. You must recognize this, I'm sure, the senior agent said, nodding to my brother in the portrait. I trust you know who to correct. By this point, I had moved from India ink to airbrushing. It was no longer enough to obliterate a traitor's face. The inky mask acknowledged that a traitor could exist, an assertion that quickly becomes traitorous in and of itself. History is the error we are forever correcting.
The senior agent guided me to my workbench. Is it necessary to do this now? I asked. The work of building socialism never ceases. It doesn't take leisure hours. He frowned at my table. It doesn't eat dessert, he said. I flattened the photograph, loaded the paint into the airbrush like a bullet into a pistol. With the patience of an Ottoman miniaturist, I corrected my brother. I began with his black leather shoes, slowly dissolving them into the floor they stood upon. Then his stockings and breeches. Our father stood behind him, and with slow, even strokes, I airbrushed an approximation of our father's trousers over my brother. And so it seemed I was not erasing Vasca, but folding him in our father's clothes, where he would remain safe and warm. I remembered drawing him when we were children, paying him in sweets to sit for me when he was angry, tearful, exhausted. I was never closer to him than when I had felt some essence of his soul press its way through my pencil onto the page. My brother now watched me as I erased his eyes. When my brother's face disappeared into my father's dress shirt, I looked to the boy standing behind him, and I wondered what judgments he cast as he stared through the lens into the future where he met the gaze of the man he had become. And I knew then, beyond doubt, that I had sealed myself to the state, that my faith had become unshakable, my loyalty unimpeachable. Because if this was wrong, if we did this in vain, then all the water of the Baltic wouldn't be enough to cleanse us. I passed the corrected photograph to the senior agent when I finished. He hadn't taken his eyes from me the entire time. You know what they say about you, don't you? The agent asked, holding the photo to the light. What do they say about me? I asked. That it takes less talent to dredge a face from oblivion than to cast it back. That in that sense, you are a genius of a certain kind. Um, so I'll, I'll read one... Uh, one, one final section. So, so that, that, that uh, uh, character is the uncle of, of, uh, of, of uh, Vladimir. And um, uh, he's grown up not knowing his father's face. He, he's, he's never, never seen uh, an, an image of it. Um, and, uh, and this, this censor um, decides later in, in, in that particular story that, um, that for, every, uh, for every figure that he takes out, he's gonna put a little tiny um, postage stamp size portrait of his brother into the, into the censored image. And so the, the book is sort of structured ar around this, this collection of, of these falsified photographs in which these tiny little portraits um, um, are, are inserted. Um, and part of the book is, is about uh, this researcher's attempt to, to track them all down. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so I'll just read maybe, um, maybe just, just some of the, the ending here. I should also say that, 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 uh, that Vladimir um, gets his picture taken every year and his living room is, is, is filled with pictures of himself, um, um, sort of uh, like a crazy person. Um, and his justification for it is that, is that, he, is that he cannot uh, see in his mind what his father looked like, and he never wants his son not to know what he looked like. Sergei bought his father a smartphone for his birthday. I already have a telephone, Vladimir said. It's connected, to cords. It's connected by cords to the wall so it can't be lost or stolen. You tell me who's, whose phone is smarter. I got it for the camera. Look, Sergei said. He pressed the power button and the phone chirped to life. There's two camera lenses, one pointing out at you, one pointing out, and one pointing back at you. You can take your photo whenever you want. We live in troubling times, his father said. It's for selfies, Sergei said. His father scowled. Don't be vulgar. Sergei crossed the room to the wall of his father's portraits. Whenever he wanted to discuss a difficult subject, he addressed it to one of the simple one of the more sympathetic photographs of his father. A bit optimistic, leaving all this extra space, no? He asked, nodding to the bare wall that stretched beyond the last frame of the photograph. It's your inheritance, Vladimir said. When you become a father, you can put photos of yourself on the wall, and your child will think that you're a deluded narcissist. Let's hope you live a long time yet, Sergei said. He coughed into his fist.
A while back, he said, I found a website of this art historian. She wrote her doctoral dissertation on your uncle, the censor. His father said nothing. She's putting on some sort of temporary exhibition this month here in Petersburg. Last time I checked, digging up graves and horsing around with skeletons is still against the law, his father said. I'm not sure that old photographs on a wall are the same thing, Sergei said. Just because something isn't illegal doesn't make it right, says the old man with photographs on his wall, Sergei said. His father responded by making a farting sound with his lips. Sergei plopped down into the armchair. He knew, of course, that his father had typed the name Roman Markin into the search engine, had left it there for Sergei to find. Neither of them could risk the vulnerability of a direct request. Instead, each had become sensitized to the intimations of the other. Sergei would make a suggestion, and his father would refuse. The more adamant his father resisted, the closer Sergei felt to the raw nerve anchored so deeply in his father that it might have been his soul. Go with me, Papa, Sergei asked. I never will, his father said. He went. A thick paste of July humidity plugged the space between Nevsky Prospect traffic on the evening the temporary exhibition opened. Let's go in, Sergei said. They'd been circling the block for an hour. It's nearly over, Papa. At the corner, an ice cream vendor knelt and stuck his head into the freezer. Do you think a freezer does the job as well as an oven? Vladimir asked. I think he's just trying to stay cool, Sergei said. Vladimir scanned the street for other potential instruments of self-harm. It shouldn't be so hard. Standing on a street corner in Petersburg should put one in mortal jeopardy. Let me die before I pass the ice cream stand. Vladimir prayed. He passed the ice cream stand. Let me die before I reach the sunglass stand. Vladimir prayed. He passed the sunglass stand. Just ahead, the gallery loomed. The polished door handle glinted. If he died right now, a heart attack, a bolt of lightning, he would, at the last moment, consider himself spared. Let me die before I open this, he asked. He opened it. A few attendees meandered through the exhibit. Vladimir would remember none of them. He would remember, walking, he would remember opening the door for his son, stepping into the cool gallery air, looking up to see a mugshot of his uncle blown up to two meters tall, staring directly down at him. Roman Markin, 1902 to 1937. Are you okay? His son asked. He hadn't realized that he was leaning on Sergei. I'm sorry, he said, your leg. My leg is fine. What's wrong? 1937. That's when I told my teacher that my uncle was a spy. It's not your fault, Papa. I thought that maybe he'd go to jail for a few weeks until he was found innocent. How could he be shot for something he didn't do? It was in the middle of the purges. He was just unlucky, that's all. A woman wearing a long skirt approached. I was a snitch, Vladimir said, and turned back to the mugshot. A snitch. The name tag on the woman, woman's blouse read Nadia. Thank you for coming, she said. My uncle, he thought. We appreciate your interest, she said. My uncle, he thought. The museum is closing now, she said. My uncle, he thought. Is he okay, she asked. I don't want to die, he thought. Sir, she asked. Not yet, he thought. Do you need a doctor, Papa? Sergei asked. Not yet, son, he thought. Sergei wrapped his arm around his father's waist to steady him. I've got you, he said. Vladimir led Sergei lead him to the wooden chair b beside a tray of, un of untouched cheese cubes cut into damp cubes. The woman fanned his face with an exhibition catalog. Sergei gave his hand a reassuring squeeze. Ask, you, ask her what you need to, he said. You need to. What has happened to my asshole boy, he thought, and who is this thoughtful person he has become? This censor, this Roman Markin, Vladimir nodded to the enlarged mugshot taken in Cresty the night that the censor was arrested. Tell me about him, please. The curator peered at her watch and pursed her lips. Perhaps you feel like taking a tour, she asked. 
She took him along, them along one side of the gallery, explaining the security apparatuses awe for the power of images, the history of alteration and censorship, the India ink masks, the early application and refinement of the airbrush. Vladimir leaned on Sergei. They passed a wall of men and women with inked out faces. This one right here, she said, this is where it began for me. This is the image the prosecution used in the censor's trial, but it also contains one of Markin's mysteries. Take a look, see if you notice anything odd. The first photograph portrayed an empty stage where a ballerina had been airbrushed out. Beside it, the original unaltered image hung. Vladimir studied the dancer. Irina Portnova was a prima ballerina in the Kirov, the information card read. Her career ended when she was charged with espionage, sabotage, and wrecking. If you look at Markin's falsified version, you will notice that Portnova's hand has been left floating above the stage. Was it an error? A warning to the viewer? An act of dissent. It is difficult to stay. Take a look in the background of both images. If you study them closely, you might notice an addition of a figure the censor, in the censored version. Roman turned to the altered photograph. Roman Markin did one remarkable thing, the curator was now saying. Beginning in the 1930s, nearly every time he expunged a face from a photograph or painting, he inserted one. Where, Vladimir asked himself, within the somber suit, beneath the general's epaulets. No, 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 until finally, my goodness, yes, there he is in the audience, gray-eyed, cowlicked, peaceful. You thought you had forgotten his face, Vladimir, that he was lost, expunged, but there, in the third row, he stares out, not at the dancer, but at you. To be here, he thought, at this late hour in your life, and to recognize your father, to find him, it makes the whole world you've wandered through feel as narrow as a blade of grass. I think I'll end there.